I'm going to leave it to Mishy to introduce Greg and Ted, who need no introduction. Uh, and I'm going to introduce Mishy, who needs no introduction, at least uh, I think so. Um, as, I, as I said earlier, SFLC is, from my point of view, a teaching practice. The most important thing that it produces isn't free legal assistance to software developers, and it isn't uh, pro bono practice opportunities for people holding uh, existing law licenses. Uh, what, is, what, what is most important to me about this thing we make is, is the teaching. Uh, I met Mishy uh, uh, 11 years ago now in the uh, Columbia Summer Program in Holland for American Law Introduction for Non-U.S. Lawyers. Uh, and uh, we spent a month together, uh, and uh, a year after that, we were working together in India. And now, uh, after a decade uh, of working with me in New York and around the world, she is my law partner, the legal director of SFLC, that is the person actually figuring out how we deliver all these legal services that we have not enough resources uh, to deliver. Um, she has uh, uh, become uh, extraordinarily adept in understanding the modes of communication of the people who make wonderful free software. And faced with two of the most important free software makers in the world, it seemed to me that it was appropriate to leave the task of talking to them uh, to her. So uh, I turn it over to Mishy, who turns it over to Greg and Ted. And I am looking forward to this, not only because I don't have to do the work, but because I really want to find out what these guys say when they're feeling comfortable, which they never are around me. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Evan. It's not the coffee break yet, but you can go help yourselves with some candy. Uh, we're celebrating many festivals, and as you can tell I'm with, from my brown skin, I'm from a different continent, and we're also celebrating Diwali in addition to Halloween. Go help yourself with some candy. The sugar <laughs> rush cannot match to what we're going to have now. <laughs> well, here are two really great clients, and they have come to talk to us, and they look particularly good to me because they're not my clients. <laughs> Like every other lawyer, after a while, you reach a position when other people's clients really, really look good. <laughs> and uh, here I am. I have lots of clients, and we will have at least two of them who are very interesting to me also talk in uh, the latter part of this afternoon. But um, yeah, this is a self-indulgent conversation about lawyers, what they like, uh, people about whom there are no um, jokes because they're all true stories. Um, no, it's not. <laughs> Honestly, what um, jokes aside, I'm extremely honored and glad that you guys agreed to sit down for this conversation. Um, the truth of the matter is that what we wanted was uh, the leadership of the world's most important copyleft project to talk about, in their own words, what's the right way and what's not the right way in their judgment about their project to make it legally strong and do what the project wants to do. What is the process of getting people to obey copyleft rules? What that process ought to be as the project sees it? We all do all kinds of stuff, and there has been a lot of conversation here and there, so I thought it was a good opportunity and idea to just sit down and talk about it. And it's my very great pleasure to welcome Greg Crow Hartman and Ted Cho. And uh, I'm going to read out your very long bios. <laughs> I don't think people in this room really need to, but uh, it's very fascinating. So give me an opportunity. And please, the candies are waiting. Greg is among distinguished group of software developers who maintain Linux at kernel level. In his role as Linux Foundation Fellow, he continues his work as the maintainer for the Linux Stable Kernel branch and a variety of subsystems while working in a fully neutral environment. He also works closely with the Linux Foundation members, work groups, labs projects, and staff on key initiatives to advance Linux. Greg created and maintains the Linux Driver project. He's also currently the maintainer for the Linux Stable Kernel branch and a variety of different subsystems that include USB, staging, driver, core, sysfs, among others, stuff which automatically works. 
Most recently, he was a fellow at SUSE. Greg is an advisor to Oregon State University's Open Source Lab, a member of the Linux Foundation's TAB, uh, sorry, Technical Advisory Board, and has delivered a variety of keynote addresses at developer and industry events, and has authored two books covering Linux device drivers and Linux kernel development. Welcome. Ted Cho is the first North American Linux kernel developer and started working with Linux in September of 1991. I'm doing the math in my head where I was at that time. <laughs> He's, he also served as the tech lead for the MIT Kerberos V5 development team and served as chair of IP security working group at the IETF. He previously served as CTO for the Linux Foundation and is currently employed at Google. Ted is a Debian developer and is the maintainer of X4 file system in the Linux kernel. He's the maintainer and original author of E2F Sprague's user space utilities for X234 file systems. Thank you very much, both of you. And I'm going to sit down and take this mic so that we can actually talk. So I'm going to ask you a few questions. <laughs> sure. So you have spent years building the project, and I read out these long bios. Um, and it's an exceptional free software project. It's quite large, very complex, extremely sophisticated, with lots of different parts, but also behaves in a highly disciplined manner. How does such a large structure achieve this level of success? And what are its values? How? Oh, <laughs> we have no idea how we got here. <laughs> um, no, self-introspection. So one thing interesting, Ted, um, many years ago decided um, the kernel developers, we had never met each other in person. So he came up with the idea of a kernel summit. We got together 15, 16 years ago. Something like that. Yeah. And um, met each other for the first time in person. We'd only done things through email. And starting there, um, every year after that, we would meet, again, the leading kernel developers. And part of one of, the, one of the main sessions we have is what are we doing wrong and what are we doing right? And every year we kind of look at what we do and how we interact with each other how the development process works and change it based on that. So we've evolved. I mean, when we were 100 people versus 1,000 people, now we're 4,000 people a year. Um, we're 2,000 people every two months is our con contributors. Um, we changed our model. We made new tools. We made Git. Um, we've done things. So we have, over the years, constantly, constantly changed. And we'll change again. We meet next week. And we'll talk about it. We have our one session of, is Linus happy or not? <laughs> and, um, and so we go with that and we figure out what we need to change and how we need to evolve and move on. So we've evolved over the years in order to get here. So it isn't any one thing, it's just constant introspection and realizing, yeah, we might be doing things wrong, how do we make it better? Yeah, the other thing I would add is uh, certainly as the EXD4 maintainer, um, I have contributors from many different companies. And one of the things that I at least do very consciously is I'll talk to them about, so what are your needs, right? Because their company will let them work on projects that will benefit their company. And so very often it's about, okay, let's make sure I understand what are the needs of all the stakeholders um, and make sure they're all happy, right? And that they're all getting more out of contributing than they are invest in the investment cost of the contribution themselves. Uh, and you know, certainly I think that's a lot of where Linux's success has come from. Sometimes it's been serendipitous, sometimes it's unconscious, um, sometimes it's a very conscious effort to say, all right, how can we identify all the stakeholders, who are we really optimizing, for example, the ext4 file system for, because there are other file systems, and other file systems will be better at other things, so let's focus on making stronger that which the development community is most interested in. <laughs> and along those lines, um, you talk about that, um, everybody contributes to Linux in a selfish manner. Mm -hmm. I mean, contribution come from companies. Um, the joke used to be you contribute five changes to the kernel and you get a job. Well, it's not a joke. <laughs> you, get a, you get a job. Um, we all have jobs where we work for companies, most of us, all of us almost, and then, but we're contributing in a way that's selfish for that company and for that single use, but everybody benefits from it. 
because of that. And so that's good, because it's a symbiotic relationship. The community benefits from an individual company or group of people that need a specific task for them. A perfect example of this was power management. The embedded companies really were like, oh, power is really important to us. We have tiny batteries. Let's do this right. Let's get changes into the kernel. And everybody's like, yeah, that's nice, but make it work for everybody. But I'm like, well, we don't care about everybody else. We just care about us. We're the only people that care about this. We're special and unique, just like everybody else. Um, so power management went into the kernel, and it turns out that all the giant supercomputers care about that and are saving billions of dollars in power because of that. So a selfish contribution because one, pair, one company wanted a battery to last longer has helped everybody out. And that's the ecosystem that we have. It's a very, um, again, symbiotic relationship. Everybody depends on everybody else because of that. So let's talk a little bit more about the ecosystem, which you said. It has for-profit entities, non-profit entities, developers, companies, various people, and the symbiotic relationship. I'm going to go back to the values and how does that all work. One is, of course, what works for one company benefits everybody else once you start working on it. But what are the dynamics there and what are other things which make it possible for all of you to come together? Well, we all agree that, I mean, so when you contribute to the kernel, you're trying to drive Linux forward in a way that works better for you. Mm -hmm. It's a very selfish way. And that's good because that's selfish Behavior, again, benefits everybody. Look at cell phones today. There are multiple processors in them. IBM and uh, Intel was very, very selfish years ago, and they said, we want, we want Linux to work on multiple processor machines because we have these big servers. We're going to make lots of money. And they contributed in that manner. Well, that, in the end, benefited everybody, and now it's your supercomputer in your pocket. Um, it's that relationship that everybody ends up depending on other people because of it, that. And companies who understand this... Um, know this. I mean, I'll again point out, IBM and Intel are the poster childs for how to do this. They have said it makes, it saves you time and money to work with the community in order to get these things done because you benefit, you rely on Linux, everybody uses Linux, so you rely on it, so might as well, if you contribute to it, that means you're saving yourself money. You can just consume it because there's different levels of using and participating in a community, in a open source project. You can be a consumer of it, works great, but then you're never driving it forward and you're relying on everybody else to hopefully drive it forward in the way you works for you, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> yeah, the, the other thing I'll note is that uh, the spirit of giving back, there are two aspects to that. There are a certain class of developers who really, truly believe in the spirit of copyleft because they believe that it is a good thing to do in and of itself as an ethical, moral act. Um, Perhaps more important from a corporate bean counter's perspective, um, I think there have been quite a number of use cases where people have discovered that if they don't contribute, um, over time, they wish they had. Um, before I started at Google, Google was using a kernel that was um, eight or nine years out of date, I think. They were carrying a vast number of patches. They were only using ext2. They were not using ext4. And right about the time when I joined, um, a bunch of engineers said, this is insane. There's new in technologies coming up. PC, PCIe, I think, was one of them. We can't be on this ancient kernel. And they spent a huge amount of time retiring the technical debt so that they could actually use a newer kernel. And part of that was contributing changes back so that we didn't have to constantly port them to newer kernels. And Linux as an ecosystem moves so quickly that it really is in your interest if you're going to be a long-term user of the kernel um, and continuing to want to take advantage of new technologies that are coming along the way that you really want to contribute as a first-class citizen. Um, and so it's just, it's not that it's ethically and morally a good idea, it's not that the license requires it, although I suppose if you're not distributing, then maybe you don't have to. That's what Google relied on. Um, they found out that, you know, we found out that you, it's just much better to contribute, right? And just get those changes back upstream, um, and then you get that synergistic effect. Um, and so there, I think, is this great example of, you know, the spirit of copyleft is very, very strong in the Linux kernel, um, but it's not just simply because of the license. 
And, and along those lines, that's um, how we go and we recruit new companies. We see that they're using Linux, mm -hmm. and we see they're, they're using it inside them, and sometimes it's like I'll approach them and say, hey, what can I do to help you get your code merged upstream? Yeah. And as a developer, I can go in a nice, safe way, say, I want to help you, and they're like, after they get their manager's approval and that <laughs> they overcome those hurdles, it, it helps them, and they can see the benefit and the um, ecosystem grows because of that. I want Linux to succeed and survive over time. In order to do that, we constantly have to grow and expand who's using or who's contributing. And by pulling in more companies that are relying on it, making them members of our community so that they, they rely on it even more is the, is the best way to do this. It works out better. It's been proven to work over the past 10, 15 years that we've been doing this. And it's, it saves them money, so it's a business case that you can go to as well. Well, I don't have the same intellectual height or might as you do, but when we go to companies, most often we will talk about that there are four, um, four stages of engaging with free software. The first one is fear. You're <laughs> the second one is compliance, and then it's all about compliance. Uh, the third one is engagement, when they actually start contributing, which is what you are trying, which you are saying that how you as a developer can convince companies about a good business save. And the fourth one is leadership, that once you are invested and your developers are there and you understand the ecosystem, and it's, it could be for any reason, selfish or otherwise, uh, then you can perhaps start getting leadership roles. So um, I want you to at least tell us a little bit more about convincing companies about this just makes good sense. And uh, this is how you do it, and we are here. You talked earlier about you contributed five patches and then you had a job. That's, that's attractive, but that's not just what, how you get companies involved as well. No, that's not how you get companies involved. <laughs> um, so a lot of the ways through, we get our foot in the door through the compliance stage. Mm -hmm. So companies are, they learn that they need to come into compliance with our license, right? They need to figure that out. Um, a lot of companies use Linux that they don't realize they're using Linux, like the automotive manufacturers are figuring out. So I will use Microsoft as a perfect example. They had Linux kernel code that they were not publishing and they're using. So some, a friend of mine pointed out to me, I went to them and said, hey, what can I do to help you get this code merged? And they're like, oh wait, we didn't realize we had this. Yes, we will publish it. And oh, you're gonna help us, that's wonderful. Um, and we took that code, we merged it into the kernel. Um, it's a good textbook example. It started out as 12,000 lines of code, which isn't a huge amount of stuff. Over time, we cleaned it up and got it back in about 7,000 lines of code, smaller, smaller code, and it did four times the amount of, it did four, it supported four new things at the same time. Mm -hmm. Smaller code, um, merged upstream, less bugs, more features by working with the community. So there's a test case of you go in the door with compliance, as a developer, you say, I can work with you. They see the business case for it, and it becomes a better thing. Now, Linux, now Microsoft is actually a huge contributor to the kernel, to Linux. So I, I live in Seattle. I used to live in Seattle. Um, one year, the Linux Foundation, we publish who contributes to Linux and what. And Microsoft was in the top 20 contributors for one year because of this code base they had. Um, so the Seattle Times has a headline that said, is cancer cured? <laughs> because of the famous quote by Steve Ballmer. Um, and yeah, so Microsoft uses Linux a lot. And they now rely on Linux, and we've made them, we've co-opted them, they're using their resources to help make our project better. But we got our door, we got our foot in the door. As you said, they went through those four stages, and it works out really well. And now they are hiring leaders in the kernel community as members of their company now. Well, not bad copy, I would say, whoever was writing the Seattle Times that time. I won't give Mr. Nadella all the credit. <laughs> but, uh, but, but that's a very interesting example. Ted, you wanted to talk about some such? Um, no, I, no. Uh, I can't beat that story. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure there are other stories which you would like to tell. Um, You've told us the Google story. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, the, I think a Google story, the Google story is a great one there. Another example of one where we're really starting to see that is with Facebook ah. in the last couple of years. Yeah, They've hired a number of uh, really good kernel developers. Chris mm -hmm. Mason, who's the ButterFS maintainer. Mm -hmm. Jens Axpo, who's uh, you know, on the block device layer. Uh, and you know, so those are two people whom I've known, um, who have worked for probably a dozen companies, all told, you know, uh, in previous, uh, you know, incarnations of their career, 
And uh, so we have a personal relationship. Um, and that's, I think that's actually a key part of that, right? Which is we all work together and at a technical <laughs> level, we're all engineers who will help each other solve problems, right? And very often, um, you know, these are core technical problems. It's not like it's gonna jeopardize Facebook's key business interests or Google's key business interests. But we just work together, and we work together in the open source you know, domain, um, and it just benefits everybody, you know, both Facebook, Google, and everybody else. Um, and it's, I, I've been you know, really excited to see how Facebook has really grown its kernel development team and its investments. Um, and uh, yeah, I think Chris Mason was one of the first of the you know, key maintainers who sort of joined that team. Uh, and then you know, many more have joined since then. Yeah, that's at least one reason when I can <laughs> look at Facebook differently. <laughs> But um, uh, so you've given us good examples of uh, at least um, whatever adage you want to do, cancer is cured or whatever, it, to look at um, entities in a different light. Because it's, it's like, oh, here is a place where everybody comes together and talks about how to make it good and work for everyone else. So I, and you earlier said it's about the spirit of copyleft. And, uh, share and share alike, whether you want and why people think it's important. What I have learned uh, working, doing this work alone is that licenses are somewhat constitution of com communities, or at least that's how a lot of projects would like to describe them. Um, if GPL is the constitution of this community, tell us how does that constitution work? Um, don't give us nine interpretations <laughs> like the <laughs> Supreme Court judges would do, or oh, sorry, eight. Um, and what I want to ask is, what is the purpose of the license for your project? And how does the spirit and this constitution work together to make possible what you are right now doing? How does it set the community norms or the fall, the make people follow the rules? Well, well uh, first off, we have like over 4,000 developers last year. Um, so I can't claim to speak for anybody but myself. Um, but along those lines, those 4,000 developers, we had over 450 companies. And those companies are contributing. And one might argue they're only contributing because the constitution of the GPL requires that. Mm. And again, that's our, our, our step, our foot into the door of showing them how working together is a good idea. Um, people have claimed in the past, and I finally got them to stop saying it, that if we don't enforce the license, it should be, if we don't enforce the GPL license, it's the same as a BSD license. And that's flat out not true. Mm -hmm. And I've gotten those people to finally stop saying that. Mm -hmm. um, so if they say it, let me know and I'll go yell at them again. <laughs> um, but along those lines, because it's the spirit of, of sharing and it shows, it, it allows companies and people to get their foot in the door and, and change their behavior and show that you can, if you contribute in a proper manner, the benefits come back to you and the benefits come back to the project. Um, I'll call out other companies that are in perfect compliance, like Amazon. Perfect compliance with the license, however, they're not a member of our community. That's a business decision that they have made. They publish all the code that they need to properly, and yet they do not want to contribute that code. They kind of throw it over the wall when they make a device, put it out there, and that doesn't help the community in any manner. We can't take that code and use it in any way. When you throw code over the wall in large chunks, there's nothing we can do with it. We can look at it. We can mess around with it. Individuals can change their devices however they wish to want to use it, but the, uh, the project itself does not benefit because we can't accept that code in a way. We can't merge it in because we don't have a maintainer who wants to accept the role of maintaining that code. It's not broken up into small pieces that we can accept it. Um, and that's fine. That's fine for that company to do, but they're not reaping the benefits of actually becoming members of our community. Amazon has made that business decision, and they have made that decision based on what they want to do. And that's fine, and that's perfectly compliant. So there's two users of, our, that shows a user of our license, perfectly constitutionally wise, but spirit is not really benefiting from it. Okay, so, so you, that's the difference between compliance and engagement. Yes. They're in compliance, totally. but they're not engaging, and you said they're not getting the benefit of the community, and neither is community getting the benefit. Correct. So there are many definitions of compliance. 
the, no, that's, the definition oh. of compliance is correct. Is, okay. You're right, yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's so, beyond compliance. It's beyond right? compliance. Um, it's, it's sort of taking the next step beyond uh, what you must do because the law requires you to do it and what an ethical and moral citizen will do, right? And I think that concept is one that I suspect me most lawyers are familiar with because what is legally required of you as a citizen um, you know, like, you know, so I'm not supposed to kill someone. Um, however, helping someone who is injured on the street is not something that is required by the law, but hopefully it is a good thing for us to do, and, you know, people who do it are to be commended. Um, and I think that's sort of the key difference, right? There's what is required by the law, um, and then there is what a good citizen would do. Um, and hopefully we can make the case that it's actually to your benefit to be a good citizen, not just for the whole body, but you personally. So this is good Samaritans, yeah. and uh, <laughs> they follow the law, they help yeah. out each other, and uh, the license terms help, but I'm gonna go back to the question of constitution. If, if license is your constitution, it gets people to contribute, but then how do you turn them into compliant members, from compliant members to engaged members? Well, I mean, and I'll point at Amazon. Amazon knows they're doing this on purpose. That's their business decision. They know they, they're spending money in order to do this. And that's their choice in order to do this. So the Constitution gets our foot in the door. We can talk with them. We can try and convince them that's the best business decision for them to change. But it's up to them to change or not. And if they don't want to become part of our community, we can't force them, right? So the Constitution's still there. They're abiding by our laws. Wonderful. That's great. But from a community point of view, um, I don't care about Amazon anymore because of that. I can say, wonderful, that's nice, good luck, we're here if you ever want to come back to us. Um, and some bits and pieces of Amazon, it's a huge company, is coming back. And they are realizing that it's a, it is in their benefit to do that. And there's people changing the company from within to do that. But it's a slow going process. We're here if we want them, if they change. But otherwise, from a community standpoint and a project standpoint, I don't care about them. I mean, one other thing which may be helpful for some companies is that um, it's sort of a declaration of, society, of social norms, um, but there are many, many developers who care very passionately about those ethical norms. Mm -hmm. And so if you are a company who is competing for talent, mm -hmm. right, and you are in Seattle, and you could work for a company that is very enthusiastic about having their members work with the open source community, go to open source conferences, continue their relationships with their peers in the open source world, or you can work in a company where you're not actually encouraged to do all of that, right? Developers may make choices about where they wanna work based on that, right? And so, you know, if you're, you know, a recruiter at Google or Facebook or Amazon, you know, I think they know that there's a certain set of developers who care very, very much about that. And if you want to have access to all of that top talent, right, it's, you know, there are lots of things. It's the same reason why uh, companies are really embracing diversity, right? Not just because it is a good thing to do, but because you want all of the available talent available you know, as a potential uh, engineer. <clears throat> so I, I hear a, a common thread, there are developers who go within companies and then they are able to change somewhat the culture slowly, not <laughs> at the pace we would all like, but that's a possibility and that's a way people become more engaged in the community. And uh, there are various, and there may be in the beginning that people only do it because the license requires them to do and later they understand and developers help them understand that culture? Does that happen a lot in oh, building this? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's happened with so many companies. I mean, I, I will point out Intel as an example of that. Intel used to be one of the biggest violators of our license. Mm -hmm. um, we approached them in a nice manner. They hired some people when they realized they needed to do that. And those people um, changed the company from within in a radical way. Um, they worked within, this, within the structure of the company. They showed that it would be a business decision to change the company and become part of the, be compliant to start with, become part of the community, and then be a leadership, leader role in the community. And it's been a huge change. It's been a huge benefit for us. 
as a community, uh, the kernel, as far as what Intel has done over the years. And you say not as fast, but um, we're not going anywhere. So I don't care how long it takes. <laughs> um, I mean, we're approached a lot of, a lot of times I'm told when um, I'm like, you're never going to get this code from us. I mean, I've been told that so many times from companies. <laughs> um, I'm like, yeah, right. I, I'm not going anywhere. And then like five years later, I'll get the code. And it was something that they didn't want to give us because they said weird legal reasons. It's because they were just ashamed of it. It was really, really bad. <laughs> I mean, I've never seen good code <laughs> that's ever been held back. Um, so it was more it was a shame that they didn't... blame the lawyers all the time. No, it's not the lawyers. I'm blaming the developers there. <laughs> um, they don't want to publish that. And that's fine. I'm not going anywhere. And these companies turn around, and over the years, I've had so many companies that in the beginning refused to do that. They realized they needed to change. People within those companies helped change. So um, that's what makes things good. If, we, if I go to a company that's in, uh, not compliant, and I say, hey, and I slap them with a lawsuit... Now I just made an enemy of all those people in that company that were trying to lobby to change that company because I reinforced the values that, oops, what we're doing was wrong and now we need to change it and now I need to shut up and I can't talk to the community because we're, they're suing us. Mm -hmm. And that's the way you shut down doors and you shut down barriers within companies and you make those, those people that were trying to lobby and change the company from within an enemy. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to do that. <laughs> So you go and you work with them over time, over time, over time. Um, there's one silicon company right now that I've been working with for, I don't know, five, six years. It's slow. It's, it takes forever. It feels like it's a glacial pace. But there's people within that company that are trying to do the right thing. They're trying to convince the right thing and trying to do the right thing. And they want to be, they know they need to do this and change. And that's fine. I'll give them the time and give them the, the space in which to make those changes. Because I know it in, in the long run, it'll pay off. Again, if I was to slap a lawsuit on them, go in the front door that way, I'd make an enemy. And that's not, and then I'd cut that whole company and those people off from our community and keeping our project from succeeding in the long run. Yeah, the other thing I would add that it's not just engineers working from within, it's also engineering leaders. It's directors, it's managers who were formerly at, you know, IBM, Intel's, the Googles, the Facebooks of the world and they move around and then they'll move into you know, some particular company um, and they can work change from within. Um, I suspect it may happen with corporate councils too, right? So uh, it's not just engineers, I think, but it's, I think that's really the right long-term attitude that Greg just expressed, which is we're not going anywhere. You know, Linux has been around for decades at this point um, and I think no one could have guessed how far we could have come. I know. I didn't guess how far it would have came along when we started, so. Well, in later uh, in our session, we'll talk um, with some of the lawyers who actually made it happen for the big companies yeah. and the, at the trade association. So that would be an interesting thing. And some people who are not on the panel but in the room are also already doing it or have been instrumental in, in changing that culture. Um, so so what I, in your comment, Greg, about uh, it's it seems like People want to do the right thing, and they need help to do the right thing, which is to move from the stage of fear to compliance to engagement. And what you were saying is that um, the attitude of the community can determine how far that engagement goes or how much time that might take. Like, you talk about suing, and you talked also about helping. You gave examples about it. So. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about that part? Yeah, I mean, that's pretty much all I do is travel around and talk to companies and work on engaging them and bringing them into, the, into, the, into our community. Um, I'll, I have a really funny example of one company in Asia that was, had Linux kernel code and didn't want to publish it. They didn't want to merge into the kernel. They didn't want to do anything. I worked with them talked to them, it took me, I traveled to them, and it took me about a day or two to finally realize that the real reason they didn't want to do this was not a legal reason, not a technical reason, was that the CTO of the company had code that was still living in that original driver, and that the com people and the managers of that company were really embarrassed that if they published this code, that that code would then, you know, this big large driver box, blo or blob, that code would be removed, because somehow that wasn't good enough anymore. And that would be a, a it would save. That would be bad for the CTO. Like once the CTO found out about this, he's like, "No, that's not. I don't care about this code. Publish it and get it out there." And he knew the benefit of it. So there it was middle managers of the company, not technical reason, not legal reason, but it was more of a societal pressure 
to save face. So yes, all I do is work with people. It's an interaction of people and learning what their expectations are and, and working with that community. And I mean, we're all people. We're messy, squishy blobs of water, right? We're not logical things. So we all have to figure out how this works and what their societal norms are. I mean, we've been doing going to Japan for over a decade now to try and bring them in. And Japan's doing amazing things and it's part of our community. And it's going out into these other communities and learning their societal norms and pulling them in and helping them so that we all benefit in the end. Now that company is a maintainer of the drivers, of that driver subsystem in the kernel. They're an active contributor and it works out really, really well. The developers are very happy. The company's doing well. It's doing well. Yeah, and we've, you know, uh, what, three or four years ago, we started doing something similar with Korea. Um, and next year we will be going to China uh, with the, after the Linux Foundation signed a couple of new Platinum members, and we're now going to try to work with uh, the community there. Um, and, you know, I see that as a huge opportunity. There's a lot of good people over there. Well, Asia has other countries. I hope you reach all of them. Yes. And, uh, and the subcontinent uh, big system integrators can stop asking me questions about how to buy leadership oh, in yes, the community. <laughs> but so another thing about community, I mean, you mentioned um, other projects have changed on how they react to the um, company. So I will point out a bad example of BusyBox. Mm -hmm. um, they started suing their customers. And when you sue customers, <laughs> you lose your customers, right? <laughs> um, it's never a good idea to do that. Some companies sued patent rights for customers a long time ago and learned the hard way about that. Um, now BusyBox is essentially a dead project. Um, I don't want that to happen to Linux. I mean, like Ted said, we've been around for forever, our, and the only thing that's gonna stop us now is ourselves. Mm -hmm. The only thing that's gonna stop Linux. I mean, Apple and Microsoft is, has publicly said, yes, Linux is great, You're never gonna, we're never gonna keep up with you guys, now they're contributing. Um, Microsoft is, so if we harm ourselves by suing our customers, suing our community, that's gonna stop us. And that's something I don't wanna see happen because we need those people. We need to work with them. We need to overcome the barriers that are keeping them from contributing. It's not legal, it can be technical or societal issues. Work with those and bring them in. And that's the only way we're gonna succeed. Uh, you are spreading the love and the freedom to expand the community. It seems that's the only way it will work. And what I heard also was, not talking about one company, one problem, but when you see a problem, that seems that it offers an opportunity to talk to those people and bring them in by explaining how to do it right, and in, instead of putting them on defense about. Yes, oh. totally. You don't want to put people, if people on defense, they throw up walls and they hire you guys. And I'm no longer <laughs> no, litigating. No, but I mean. I'm but making win-win solutions. But, but then you put another barrier in between the developers. You put a, not just a manager you have to go through, you, know, you have to go through a legal step in order to get to that developer, not trying to cut down those barriers as much as possible. Yeah. Yeah, so there's an amusing story. There's a, a company I was working with uh, in Asia and uh, they were asking all these questions, and I was really, really sure I knew what they were going to be doing. Um, and it's like, I'm going to guess you're doing, you know, thus and so, um, and that's why you want such and so, and by the way, we should work together. And he said, um, I'm not allowed to say what I'm working on. And it was not a legal thing. I think it was just, you know, the company had that. And so the good news is uh, the Android N release kernel sources got pushed last week, and so I can now point at what we did that's now open source like okay over there that's what we're doing um we were in a uh deadline rush so we cheated in a couple of ways i would not have accepted it for upstream acceptance but we have working code and now we'll clean it up and get it upstream i'd like to work with you on that because i'm pretty sure you're doing the same thing and i'm waiting for him to get managerial approval so that he can actually admit to me that he's doing the same thing and then we can work together. So. <laughs> well, I'm uh, gonna let, yeah. open it to the floor and let other people also uh, <laughs> ask the rock stars their questions. So anyone who has questions, please raise your hand, introduce yourself, get some candy and go for it. <laughs> You can use. <laughs> there, 
their BSD licensed kernel projects. I'm wondering your thoughts on whether whether or not the license choice was significant in the in the different courses that those projects have taken relative to Linux kernel. Obviously, there are many other things that are different, but I'm wondering what what are your thoughts on the the license choice input into that, and and if it played a role, how how was it that the license choice played a role? Um, so. We've worked with the BSD developers a lot. We used to work with them more. Unfortunately, most of them got hired by Apple, or now they're Linux developers. <laughs> so there are few, very few BSD developers around. Um, the license choice, and for some companies, it did. It, it caused a fork inside the company. We'll, I'll show Juniper is a famous example of a company that took a BSD and forked and never merged back. And they went so far off into the corner that they realized they were stuck, and they had to come back. Um, so, yes, that, I think it did have some issue in the beginning of the fragmentation, but I think we were just lucky. I mean, yeah, <laughs> we, so got, we got it, lucky in the I right mean, spot. I mean, if you're going to look at the, you know, what happened in the early days of Linux, right, what slowed down BSD, it was a lawsuit, yeah. right? Yeah. It was the at and BSD license. That slowed them down a lot. It's also true that there was, you know, a lot of interesting work, for example, that Network Appliance did with the waffle file system that never got contributed back. Um, and again, that's part of the whole societal norms, right? Um, the BSD societal norm is, as far as they were concerned, that was a good thing. It was a success. They enabled network appliance to do what they did. On the other hand, no one else was able to get what they did, and it also meant that network appliance went off into their own corner, right? And so again, it's sort of the cultural norms meant that you had all these companies they forked BSD for their own commercial needs because there wasn't the norm to bring it back together. Um, you know, the effort kind of dissipated, and I think those two factors combined was one of the reasons why Linux was a spectacular success. And now there are lots of former BSD people who are working on Linux for a living. So, <laughs> just good luck. Yeah, that's great. And my, there's a lot of Microsoft ex Microsoft kernel people working on Linux too. They're yeah. really good people. <laughs> How do you think about the cultural norms as an impediment to participation in the kernel community? I was uh, recently in Japan meeting with Shibata-san from SEC, I mean from NEC rather, and asked him, after pressing him a little bit about how many Japanese engineers he thought were actively contributing, and he thought the number was very, very slow, very, very small. I was with Kondo-san, who's the head of IP at uh, Toyota, and asked him, does anyone have presumptive rights to participate in the community? And the answer was no, not anywhere in the company-specific permission. Do you think that's a cultural issue? And does the community, do you think about capacity, the number of engineers in, a, in an area versus the relative participation, or does that not even come into thinking? Well, number one, we don't track countries. Yeah. Who, and I mean, for years, people used to think I, since I worked for a German company, that I was lived in Germany. I was German. I was not. So it's very hard to track that. Um, I will point out one Japanese company, Reneasis, very large contributor to the kernel, uh, top 10 contributor for many, many years, very, very good community member, um, very strong developer. Um, there's a huge Japanese company right there. Um, other large Japanese companies are huge, Fujitsu, Hitachi, NEC. They've all been large contributors over the years. So. Um, to say that there are not many is not fair at all to them. Um, Japan has done very, very well that way. Um, but yes, we do see, I see a, a huge vacuum in some areas, in some countries, and that's why we go there. That's why we went into Japan 10, 15 years ago. That's why we were going in Korea, uh, going to China. Um, India is, already has a huge Indian population. I work with Indian developers all, all the time. So yeah, we want, I want everybody that we can get a hold of. Um, we always worry about scaling. Every year we keep going faster and faster, and every year I say there's no way we can ever keep up this pace, and every year we keep growing. Um, every kernel release we do, which is every three, two and a half to three months, we have 200 to 250 brand new developers. That's brand new developers. Um, most of those people just do one change and then leave, which is great, but you never know when that person's going to do one change and they're going to stick around. So we are very open to new developers. We need to make it very easy to contribute. We have documentation. We have outreachy programs. We have internship programs. Um, we go through great lengths in order to uh, get new people to contribute. 
Yeah. I think one interesting sign of that is that there have been a number of people who have been working to take our internal documentation inside the Linux kernel source and translate it to another language. Um, and that, I think, really helps because cultural issues, there are some interesting cultural sensitivities, but I think that's true in all cultures, right? Even in the US, there will be certain people who are you know, timid and they don't like to be out in the fray, say. Um, but the language barrier is, I think, just as big of an issue. Um, and so people are working on that. Right? I, think, I think that you know, it'll be possible for those people to work on device drivers, perhaps, without having a good command of English. It'll be harder for them to participate more deeply. Um, but maybe they will have colleagues that are you know, able to speak English well enough or at least read and write emails in English well enough that they can participate as first class citizens. Um, and you know, maybe uh, dynamic translation will get good enough one day that we can make that problem go away. But we're not quite there yet. But I mean, our <laughs> project is actually one of the best out there for people with English as not a native language. Yeah. We respond, we work only through email. Our tools and everything we use are very old in a way, <laughs> but they're very, they scale very well. And we don't rely on like OpenStack has meetings every so many often, every couple weeks. And they have online IRC chats where you have to talk in English. We don't. We don't require those things, so we are very, very approachable by English as a second language. I do drivers, so I work with majority of people whose English is not a second language at all. Uh, first. So, uh, as a as a former litigator, I'm always happy to hear uh, people are reluctant to enter into litigation. Uh, I'm, I'm very much aware of the waste and the inefficiency and the all around pain that results from taking things to court. Um, and I hear you saying that uh, you're, you're resistant to it. Uh, I, I, I guess I'd like to hear you talk a little more about whether, I, I'm also conscious that as, a, as in arriving at negotiated solutions, it's, it's necessary at times to say, and if we can't come to an agreement, we may need to go to court. Uh, but I, I, I wonder, have you got circumstances in mind when you, or do you think that the community has uh, definitions in mind of uh, what are the what are the situations where that this is where we we've, we've got to we've got to have a lawsuit, <laughs> or 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 would you say we just aren't going to do it? We, we, that's that's not the way we do business. Well, well again, we're two people out of four thousand developers, Understood. and the Linux kernel we all keep your individual copyright, so you're able to enforce your own copyright as well. Um, I'll pour, point out Harold Velte. Um, as GPL violations, he has had been very successful over the years of going after companies and getting the code out. He, um, part of that work opened or created the um, OpenWRT project, um, but that code never really got merged into the kernel. It, it formed its own community. So we'll never say, no, we're never going to sue, right? Um, the conditions on which we would do that are unique and individual, have to take on a case by case basis. Um, but along those lines, as far as enforcing our license, um, the SFLC published a, or SFC, sorry. That's SFC. SFC, sorry. Um, published a like community guidelines for GPL enforcement type thing. That's a, something that um, a number of our community members have said, hey, that's a good thing. That's, maybe you should, we should follow that. Um, but again, we're 4,000 people, and it's hard to, we can't say any good thing. But yes, we're never saying, no, we're never going to sue anybody. Um, but again, case by case basis, and we'll take it from there. But again, Harold's work shows one way in which that can be done in a manner that is successful. Yeah. We'll take one. Um, you were talking about like cultural differences between, say, the BSD world and the Linux world, and. Um, there's some old research, like well, not that old, but Stephen Weber's research on why open source works. And he talks about the fact that license shapes community and license shapes culture even more than culture you know, determines your license. And I wonder if you think that like the that GPL in particular, you know, as a license has shaped your community and your community's practices and created the kind of environment that you're talking about. Um, I'd say yes, but you're talking to the person who added firmware blobs to the kernel and made Debian not free. 
<laughs> so um, I did that 15 years ago, and that's how I now know all about lawyers <laughs> and license issues. Um, yeah. uh, I still think I was right. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, but yes, I think it does. I mean, I, I will point to myself as somebody who, over the years, has learned that um, by sharing and working in this manner, it is the best way. I come from a background of education. I was an elementary education major for a while. So my mother was a teacher as well. So um, this is a very strong way, a very good way to teach other people and to teach people and let them grow themselves. Because we're giving people, when you contribute to the kernel, we're letting you as an individual show your work, and that also makes your work better. And that enables you to grow and you to get a better position and you to help other people as far as things go that way. So I think, personally, yes, our license has helped that. It's helped change me in that manner and it's helped me make, grow. And I hope it's helped us make other people better because of that license. That's my personal. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think it's sort of a side to the major thrust of your question, but I think it's not only that the license shapes the community, which I think the answer to that is, of course, but the fact that uh, our developers are come from a very diverse set of companies, which means we have to de manage multiple stakeholders uh, in a way that, for example, MySQL didn't have because they hired all of their developers, right? So the company and the open source developers were the same. Or companies where they take code and they throw it over the wall and they make it be open source, but all of the engineers are with that company. Um, and that creates its own cultural dynamic, um, which, in my opinion, you can be a lot healthier if you have developers from many stakeholders and we consciously have to manage that um, as a part of our engineering work. Well, there's a lot of unity in your diversity and diversity in unity. I will take one more question and then we'll move on to the next session. Just the last one. So I think the idea of license as a constitution building the culture is really interesting, but I also question whether or not the communities have become so diverse that that culture has become diffused. And I think many of the people in the, this room know that there's at least one member of the community that's decided to become a copyright troll. Uh, I'm talking about Patrick McCarty. And I think the risk of the community is that, you know, while the community was small and cohesive, there's the informal mechanisms of the community work very effectively. However, I think the challenge the community face and faces right now is because there is no mechanism to reach consensus on the points in the GPL, I mean, even things as simple as, where does the written offer come from? Does the written offer come from the entity that sells it? McCarty's claim is, um, if you're a large Korean manufacturer of Android phones, getting the written offer from the parent company in Korea is not satisfactory. It has to be through the sales sub, which you know, is located in some other jurisdiction, because that's the one that's sold in Germany. So I think that the Constitution needs some work because we need to come to some consensus to what, um, you know, what compliance actually means. And I actually spoke with Harold Welty about this in Barcelona, and his statement was, well, I can't tell other people what compliance means. Well, what that means is you have potentially 13,500 views of compliance, which I don't think is going to be, uh, I don't think that's going to benefit the project. So, I mean, I can't, I don't know the specifics of that case because I've not been told the specifics of that case. Um, I will say that the community, um, the NetFilter community has made a public statement about what they consider to be appropriate compliance, what they consider their developers should abide by and what they should do. So that is that community saying, as a majority, what they feel should be correct. Um, again, we have 10,000 contributors over years how those contributors choose to enforce their copyright is up to them. That's part of the license, part of our agreement. Um, but you can look at the societal norms on which that specific community has publicly stated, maybe that's how that should be addressed. Well, and more so, I believe they actually said they would not accept any more contributions from that particular individual until he clarified what the heck he was doing. Right, so there, is, there are societal pushbacks that can happen. Um, these interacts with laws in interesting ways. I'm not sure we have time to go into that here, but I, I, I think it suffice to say there are 
actions that are happening to try to naturally correct that, it may take a while. Sure, but then again, the joke is you have two lawyers in a room and you have three results, right? Something like that. I mean, it's you got different community members wishing to uh, address the gray areas in our license in different manners. Um, all we can do is point out the societal norms, the community norms of which we think everybody should abide by and take it from there. I mean, there's nothing else we can do. You know, I understand that that was how the community was started, but I think that's an ab uh, abrogation of responsibility. I think the community needs to, you, we need to find a way to come together to decide what compliance is. Because in many cases, you know, sir, obviously there are cases where people have, you know, completely screwed up and not put the license in. But there are fundamental gray areas, and if, and if there are three different opinions for that, and there's no one selected by the community, then I think you're letting down the people who are trying to use the software. Yeah, Mark, it's more of a hack on the German legal system than it is on copyright and GPL. And uh, this can only really occur in Germany because of no, the it can occur, it, it Well, can uh, again, I mean, and, we're a community. We have different opinions. We embrace those opinions. We can offer suggestions on what our community members should and shouldn't abide by. But it's up to those members to do. I mean, th legally, that's all we can do. Legally, that's all you can do now. What I'm saying is that you need to have a different approach. Because if you don't, and if you get 10, 100 people taking different views of this, then just like BusyBox, Linux will be as dead as BusyBox. Not as quickly, but at least potentially. I, mean, I, I guess you know, something, something that's been bouncing around in my head for a while now uh, is that I, I approve uh, all third-party tech being used at Oracle. And consequently, I see a lot of different different use, a lot of different licenses, a lot of the same licenses applied to platforms with significant technical differences. And one of the things I am seeing as a part of that is wildly different interpretations of the license, depending on which not only which individual within a community, but also across communities, even with some consistency. But it only, as long as, to, to Mark's point, as long as a given community, and, it, and the, this horse may be out of the barn for the colonel, right? It may be, at this point, not only did a community evolve around it, but you've already got 10,000 contributors, right, who, who've signed on to a particular interpretation. But at least with respect to new tech, I actually think that there's some potential value in setting out clear interpretations of a license within a community as at the genesis of that community. One of the, one of the potential projects that's been bouncing around in my head is you know, establishing a, a, a depot or a set, set of materials, something that would be useful for new projects to clarify their, the interpretation of the license for their platform. I'm not sure it helps you, but. So it, it, it's, it's my great pleasure that these gentlemen are not my clients so that I don't have to actually just jump in front and say, don't answer that question. Uh, but, but take my advice uh, from an interested bystander and don't answer that question. Uh, of, course, uh, of course what is being said is absolutely crucial. You can't have uh, compliance without blood, sweat, and tears if we don't have an answer for you. But I, I don't think these gentlemen should be on the spot about it. Um, I, I, I understand why if it, it seems like it's their problem because it's their project. Uh, but, but it's not their problem because it's their project. It's our ecosystem, and we've all got a part in this. And if you'll let me uh, advise that you wait a little bit, as I have done before, I'm going to try and answer your question a little later this afternoon, because I think it is a crucial question. Uh, but I don't think the way to get an answer to it is to say, now, fix your project, please. <laughs> uh, because that carries us back to this odd situation in which projects are essentially test cases for other people's concerns. And no matter how serious those concerns are, and no matter how well-founded they are, 
Uh, what lawyers ought to be doing for projects is allowing them not to have to deal with those questions so they can make some software, which is what people really want to be doing. If the only way that we can get an answer for what Mark is concerned about or what is roaming around in your head is to tell projects, you have to spend a lot of time on legal hermeneutics, then we as lawyers have failed. Okay. Yeah, then you get um, Linus's quote about lawyers, right? Uh, I mean, yeah, well, I didn't actually mean to. I was kind of hoping we could. I said that was Linus's quote. I yeah, just I, all right, so we'll go around it because <laughs> yeah. it was Linus's quote, and you're all here. And, and thank you very, very much for coming. Thank you very much. <laughs>